uh, making sure that our sermon certainly has some contemporary application to some of the goings on in our larger culture and in our society. And, uh, I think that there's a number of ways, amen, that uh, we are always being compelled to apply our faith in this space and time, and uh, it is no different uh, with the recent verdict that came out yesterday and all the different tragedies and challenges that many of us are engaging and facing. Uh, how many of you know that when we say the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, uh, the only way we can really demonstrate that is by actually making it that way. Meaning that there are a lot of different responses that we could have to challenges and tragedies that happen. But one good way is to make sure that when difficulty comes, um, the first thing, the first person or the first set of wisdom that I should consult should be God's word. You know, prophet's role was to answer the question, is there a word from the Lord? And how many of you know that no matter what situation you're going through, there's always a word from God? And uh, this word is prayerfully a word that today we will uh, spend some time thinking in. Uh, being challenged by the name of the Lord. Psalms 137 uh, is where we will spend our time. The Word of God uh, is uh, projected on the screen. Amen. So if you just want to follow along on the screen, uh, or if you'd like to follow along in your text, uh, either one will suffice. Uh, let's, let's, let's be together. Page 502 in your church Bibles are on the screen. Psalms 137, real quick, some background, is written... Uh, by uh, one of the historians or psalmists who experienced exile. Children of Israel found themselves in a place and situation where they were in uh, a foreign country. They found themselves under the thumb, if you will, uh, under the control, uh, under uh, enslavement, conquered by their worst enemy. And in the midst of all of this reality, uh, these words were written and penned um, to give voice to the feelings and the, the, the kinds of challenges and the honesty uh, of how children of Israel were enduring that experience. This is why I love scripture. If you take scripture seriously, a lot of people that don't take scripture seriously feel like it is an outdated, ancient book that has no relevance for today. And uh, they treat it like it's, you know, uh, similar to you know, Aesop's fables or, you know, these, these kind of uh, 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 other kind of contemporary classical texts. But I want to submit to you that if you take the Word of God seriously and ask God, what is this trying to teach me today? Uh, I find that Scriptures say things that we often would not dare say, but that often needs to be said. Right. Yeah. Scriptures often lift up things that we are inclined to try and, you know, uh, avoid. Right. But in our lives, I think we all must be honest that uh, avoidance is never a, uh, a, a strategy for overcoming. Right. And then sometimes you got to face some of your worst fears head on. You have to face some of the worst conditions of your life with the power of God uh, as your assumption. Um, and I love that the scriptures give to us countless opportunities to see how uh, a very human experience uh, throughout history has uh, still brought great victory and power to people who are looking for God uh, in their most challenging moments. In this way, uh, let us turn our attention to Psalms 137. Let's hear what the Word of God says. Alongside Babylon's rivers, we sat on the banks and we cried and cried, remembering the good old days in Zion. It was alongside the quaking aspens or trees or willows where we stacked our unplayed harps. That's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking, sing us a happy Zion song. But oh, how could we ever sing God's song in this strange or foreign land? Amen. This is indeed, I think, one of the great questions. Uh, it is a lament. Uh, it is a question of theodicy. It is a question 
that if we're honest, many of us ask, how can I dare be faithful to God when I find myself in such a hard situation? Anybody ever ask themselves that question or you feel the pressure of that? Well, we're going to spend some time preaching from the topic today. We will make it through the strange land. We will make it through the strange land. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing. That means preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them you will make it. Strange man. Pass up on the chance to just encourage yourself and say, I will make it. I will make it through this strange land. Now, uh, it is indeed one of the fundamental truths and assumptions of Christian faith is that when Jesus came to the earth as the Son of God, the, the, the one who was a sin. Through the love of God that uh, no one should perish, but all would have access to everlasting life and salvation. This Jesus was sent and came to the world as fully human and fully divine. Meaning that uh, in order for Jesus to truly be our Savior, in order for Jesus to really uh, be able to have within his life, ministry, and experience the ability to relate to our struggles. Christian faith has affirmed that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Right. This kind of intersection, if you will, I believe is one of the most challenging aspects of what it means for us as followers of this same Jesus. Because Jesus, while he was on the earth, uh, was not so spiritual that he transcended or elevated himself above the physical challenges of human beings. Even while Jesus was performing divine acts, how many of you know he was still caught up in what it meant to be human? Right. When Jesus was feeding the 5,000, how many of you know Jesus eventually got tired? When Jesus was walking on the water, how many of you know, he probably got wet. Amen. <laughs> that he wasn't so spiritual and so divine that he was able to detach himself from the reality of what it means to be human. And one of the great challenges that you and I must appreciate as we follow the ways of Jesus is that you and I can do all that we can to follow God and to chase after God and to adjust our lives to the plans of God and at the same time still find ourselves, as Alistair McIntyre says, uh, exposed to the tragic vulnerability of our existence. Right. That we as a people can still be so contingent and, 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 and left to Forces that are at many times out of our ability to control. How many of you know that some of us, life will present potholes that we did not do? Some of you ever drive down the street and you hit a pothole and your tire just bursts. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and you have to pay for the busted tire. Even though you didn't put the pothole in the ground. Right. How many of you know some of us got some potholes that we have created? Some of us walk around with jackhammers. Amen. It's in our back pocket. It's called bad decision making. You know, and, 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 and sometimes that's what it means to be human as well. That every single person in this world makes mistakes. Right. So what it means to be you. Amen. So sometimes you got potholes that you did not create. Sometimes you have potholes that you do create. But the, 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 the shared common experience is that in order for us to be human, we will often have to endure hard times. 
Right. right. And it's so important to appreciate and distinguish between what kind of times and potholes are within our power to address. Now, many of us who uh, have somewhat of a social consciousness are constantly finding ourselves frustrated and upset with the ways in which our world cannot seem to overcome difference. How we may share the same spaces, but because of the color of our skin, or part of town we're from, or our nationality, or any of these other kinds of categories, they have been successfully used to divide us, cause us to minimize each other's humanity. And yesterday, we all, some of us, you know, may have heard of these verdicts that came out of Florida, another bad verdict, amen, that continues to demonstrate in many spaces that the lives of our young black men in particular are a continuous threat, not just to folk who don't look like us, but to even folk who do. Yeah. I've had a lot of conversations with folk who you love to say, you know, how come folks aren't so upset when there's black on black crime? And I said, for the same reason that folks aren't so upset when there's white on white crime. Right. You know, I mean, you know, uh, but most of the time, you know, uh, whenever there's crime, black folks seem to go to jail for it. Praise God. I don't know. I mean, unless you OJ, I mean, he's probably the most popular one who seems to have gotten off and then least that moment. So, like, you know, uh, someone texted me or tweeted me or something last night, or, you know, telling me all these different kind of ideas and thoughts, and, and, and they said, you know, Pastor Mike it is, you know, uh, disingenuous for this outrage at this moment because uh, the biggest problem is is the intra group problem, not the group to group problem. And I try to communicate that you know this kind of distinguishing between uh, the shared kind of assumptions that are propagated across the country is the real issue. Because many of the young people that I engage that act violently towards one another uh, are not born inherently violent. So there must be some kind of a shared well of water that we are all drinking from that conditions us to believe that uh, when I see a black body, I must be afraid of that black body. So much so that whether I'm black or white, I must use lethal violence to neutralize that black body. Talk about a young man, and you know, they tell me, well, Pastor Mike, you know, when I see someone who looks different than me walking down the street towards me, I don't feel threatened. But when I see someone who looks like me, I seem to have a certain level of fear. Or, and, and I ask them, where did you get that fear from? Because don't your mom and daddy look like you? And when you see your mom and daddy, I don't see you running across the street or you know, pulling for your piece or whatnot. Could it be that regardless of what your racial background is, our country has been able, as uh, Hesey Cole said in one of his articles, uh, that the irrelevance of black life has been drilled into this country since its infancy. That we are a country that have made all of us afraid of these dark bodies. And what does it mean that we can practice the same faith but can't see the image of God in one another? Amen. To me it says that we as a people find ourselves in a strange land. And be clear, child of God, that this is not a strange land that just became strange yesterday. Amen. We must not live as a historical people who think that the problems just were created yesterday. This is a great gift for us because it means then that the solutions are not new either. But if you and I can take seriously the way that has been paid for us, the life that can be found in the ways of Jesus, that these pathways can lead us out of the strange land that we're in. That you and I must take seriously that the questions that deserve challenging are not only the whys and the hows. Could this happen? But also we must ask ourselves, what am I prepared to do to make this thing that has been meant for evil in our lives be turned into a good? And make no mistake about it, all of us got challenges that we have to wrestle with and ask ourselves, will I be defined by the worst thing that has happened in my life? 
Or will I have the courage and the faith that God can turn every single incident into an opportunity for redemption? Now be clear, child of God, uh, it is not uh, without great effort and faith and discipline that we will get out of this strange land. Because part of what gets us in the strange land is a straying away Amen. from God's way. Amen. Now, in the religious narratives of scripture, we have characters like Job who wrestle with why do bad things happen to good people? Theologically, it's called the Odyssey. Pastor Donna preached last week about figures like Esther who experienced these levels of privilege where her people are threatened with genocide, but she herself finds herself seemingly inculcated in the king's house. But she has to be shaken out of her trance, right? Uh, that just because you're in the king's house don't mean you are, 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 are sheltered, praise God. Some of us can get a little bougie, praise God, and sophisticated, and you know, get a little money, praise God, a little privilege. And we can start to be like, well, if them folk would just do this, then everything would work out okay. But I found that much of the problem is not with them folk out there more than it is with this folk in here. And the change that is required is often the change that starts with us. We say in some of our training that the first revolution must first be an internal one. Yeah. And I am captivated by the Bay Area and all these justice movements across the country where everybody likes to talk revolutionary. But no one seems to be able to live revolutionary. And we will, oh, you know, uh, we, we gotta march, we gotta do all this, and I ain't hate no march because I march. <laughs> Y'all know I march. I can march. I can march. But you know, folks say never again. And they said the same thing after the Trayvon Martin incident. Right. Never again! Not on our watch. After the Rwanda genocide happened, we had an elected official say, never again! After the new town, never again! Even here in the Bay Area, after baby Hiram was killed, a little two, three year old baby, never again! But after two days of outrage, maybe something how it's easy for all of us just to go back to business as usual. Yeah. We're in a strange land when we can see the evil running amok in our world and we can just keep moving along. Yes. Like business as usual. Yes. We're in a strange land when we can be so overwhelmed by our passions that we forget our purpose. Yes. We're in a strange land when you can believe the lie, yes. rather than the truth. We're in a strange land when we allow the culture of death that is at work in our communities, in our country, in our world, to allow us to believe that the response must be more death when actually the response to death is life. Yes. Right. And as people of God, the response to death is not just life, but it's resurrection. Yeah. And it is a resurrection that has been given to us today that never counts you and I out. Understand this, child of God, that even though you may find yourself in a strange land, never forget that it is strange to God. Because how many of you know, ain't nothing surprising God. And this is why you and I must be people who stay connected to God. Because when you and I get disconnected from God and start to allow
Right. You gotta know that. I can solve this problem. How many of you know there are problems in our lives and in our world that we can't solve on our own? That our wisdom is not able to get us where we need to go. That's true. And when we get humble about what we don't know and what we can't do, then we create space for God to do the supernatural. Let this strange man go. So you can hold on to God with the same kind of power and grip. Love the story of the Hansel and Gretel. Don't know it all that well. But I like this notion. That in order for them to find their way out, they had to use some breadcrumbs. How many of you know God's given you some breadcrumbs? that can lead you out of the strange land. Jesus said it like this, I am the bread of life. Right. Now I'm here to tell you, some of us need to take some of these bread crumbs <laughs> and let it be our trailing path out of the strange land. Right.
And all you gotta do is take a step up to God. And I love it how God even says sometimes you come down to where you are. He told David that even if you make your bed in hell, I'll be there. And how many can testify to that? I've been in hell. Says always trumps how we feel. 
Did you ever have five telling you got work to do? It says get to work. Yes, get to work. Why should we get to work? This is what God says, for I am with you. Yes. Oh, I have mercy. Yes. He says, put into action the words that I covenanted with you, that I promised you. Why? Because I'm living and breathing among you right now. Trust God. Trust 
Yeah. Believe what God says. Yeah. I'm in a strange land of depression, but God says that joy comes in the morning. Right. Yeah. My relationship is on the rocks, but God says that He can reconcile. He has a ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. Enough resources to get done what I need to get done, but God says, I will supply all your needs. Yeah, it's good. Remember what God says. Don't be dominated by your feelings and your emotions. And then the final thing that the scripture says that I just find so powerful. Verse number four, or two, or three, one of these verses. <laughs> It says that they laid their harps on the trees. And I believe if you want to come out of a strange land, child of God, you got to pick up your heart. Yeah. Good. You got to pick up your instrument. What am I talking about? These children of Israel, while they were in bondage, still brought with them the tools that they had when they were free. But rather than using those tools, yeah. They made them down. That's right. Because they were in exile. That's right. What's the purpose of having uh, a, a, a spare tire? And then when you get a flat tire, you can sit in a car upset right. and won't get out and change your tire. <laughs> What's the purpose of an ambulance coming to pick you up off the road when you are injured and you sit there saying, Wait until I get well and then we'll go to the hospital. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous and foolish. Some of us have these tools. We just came out of a month long consecration. Mm. And I hope some of us, you know, went into consecration with one tool in our belt and came out with ten. Amen. And my question to you is, are you using your tools? Or the further away you get from your consecration, your spiritual boot camp, them back on the ground. Child of God, learn from this text that when you are tormented and when you are being scorned, it is not for you to leave your heart on the tree. God's giving you something to do and something to you. You may be in a certification program. Why? 
need to love.
going to these, these drug houses. You know your pastor was caught on surveillance coming out of a drug house? What? The police said, Brian, the officers think that you're a drug dealer. And, 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 and assault us, but God, I'm so mad. So mad. 
and we can look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. I pray for my brother and my sister who I'm touching. I squeeze victory and power into their hand. I squeeze the anointing of God. As I squeeze their hand, Lord, I pray that you will allow them to feel the infusion of your spirit. Lord, let hope and power fill their body right now. Yes, Lord. Let victory and courage overtake their senses right now. Let healing and purpose be unleashed inside of them. Let every work of the enemy, Lord God, must be defeated right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, let my brother and my sister know and be reminded that no weapon that's formed against them shall Let us come out with victory and power. 